Dear brethren, you can imagine if I started to tell you experience and stories of things that has happened in all these years, traveling from one place to the other, knowing so many thousands and thousands of believers in of many denominations, sometimes of any style and other ones of another kind. But there is something that has called my attention is that what I'm going to speak to you about is the uh, subject of conversion. The title of this message today is The Greatest Miracle, without any doubt, is the conversion. In my case, uh, um, forgive me to uh, put myself as an example, I converted right away. It didn't take me a long time to give the step of accepting Jesus as my savior and personal Lord. I went one morning to a church and there was a Sunday school. There was not a calling, not it was spoken in an evangelistic manner. But in the evening when I came back in the first service, uh, with a preaching, with worship, with a calling that I assisted in my life. In that first meeting, I received Jesus as my Lord and personal Savior many years ago. And it was not hard for me to receive Christ. It, I believe it has been the more wise uh, and better decision that I have taken in all my life. And I will never repent of taking that decision. I would have liked to receive the Lord sooner but the Lord has his times and his occasions for each one of us. But observing how some people convert is something that has called my attention a lot because there's, for example, people that have converted, not many, I have known some that they converted alone by themselves, reading maybe the Bible or in the room of their houses, kneeling and asking forgiveness for their sins or they converted by themselves without nobody, anybody preaching, nor going to any church, nor listening to any pastor preaching, only by themselves in their car, in the house, or whatever they converted. It's not the most common. It's not what is more common. The Bible says, how will they believe there is no one preached to them, right? But there are persons that have converted by themselves. I don't know if here in this evening among us or at home there is watching us at their houses, is anybody that can say, yes, I converted by myself. But it's not the normal thing. But I have seen there are persons that have converted after a long process. Persons that have been days, uh, weeks, months, assisting to church, I don't know if even uh, for years to a church. And afterwards, after listening to dozens and dozens of preachings, after singing many songs, and le listening to many testimonies, at last they take the step of accepting the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. Nevertheless, there are other persons as me that uh, did it right away, instantaneously, and there are other persons that they have become, they have converted, but they have been hard for them. They have had to uh, reach the bottom they had to lose everything, their job, their family, their health. They have lost practically everything. And at the end, when they didn't have anything else, is when they decide at last definitively to receive Jesus and give an opportunity to him in their life. I have also known persons that have converted because they were afraid. I explain myself. Fear uh, because of eternal condemnation or because of the uh, judgment to come or to be externally, uh, or because they were afraid of being eternally uh, excluded from the presence of God. And because of that uh, fear, they decided to change and follow Jesus. The, why, the Bible says that the beginning of wisdom is the fear to God. But in that same book of Proverbs, there is another verse that looks similar, that is like that one that says, the first step of wisdom is to hate bad. And some have seen the bad ways they took and the bad decisions because of fear to be content, because of fear of getting lost, they decide at the end to give the step. Be, however, to see a person that is converted, for me, is the miracle that is greatest of all the ones that you can experience in your life, because it's the only miracle that Satan cannot imitate. And other miracles, he can imitate. And sometimes he imitates those miracles. But the miracle of conversion to transform a life, the devil, that miracle, he cannot uh, uh, do it. He cannot uh, make that another person have that experience if they have not accepted the Lord. 
a true conversion has to have three elements that are um, principal. Uh, I'm going to mention them and explain to you for you to have them very clear. All true conversion has to have justification, regeneration, and adoption. Let's start from the beginning. Justification is the word that is used in the Bible to say that the sinner has been declared righteousness, righteous, clean of sin, as if never had sin, starting from the from new. If you prefer to use the term be born again, you can use it. The Bible says in Romans 5 that justified for the faith we have peace. By the faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, God, just not ju God does not justify sin, but the sinner that repents. To be, the, uh, to be said that we are righteous to present before God without being ashamed. Once you have received him and accept him as your Lord and personal Savior, to know that you are free of all condemnation, as the Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, you are a new creature. The old things pass away, everything is made new. And now there is no condemnation, no condemnation, brethren, none for the ones that are in Christ Jesus the ones that do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You know how wonderful it is to be free of all condemnation and to be able to pray, to be able to sing to God, to be able to honor the Lord, knowing that all my sins have been forgiven because of the love of God. Isn't it wonderful, brethren? Isn't it wonderful? Doesn't it deserve a strong amen, the Lord, and his applause, of course, why not? It's wonderful, free, free, hallelujah. How wonderful is the freedom, terrible, uh, not to use it rightly, but uh, it's a privilege, the freedom, that is to be justified. That is what is known, the justification, but regeneration is the change instantaneously as also progressive that is taken in a life that is born again. It's clear that our sins are forgiven right away instantaneously, but our life does not change instantaneously. We go into a long process, and there the Lord starts to mold us, starts to treat with each one of the areas of our life, it starts to come out things that we didn't even know that we had them. It's like when you they uh, hit the gold and all the impurities uh, come out and they remove them. And that's what happens after we have been justified by the Lord, that the Lord starts to deal with our character. The Lord starts to deal and treat things of our past that is still in our mind uh, would like to uh, make us have hard times. And the Lord starts to transform us. The Lord starts to mold us. And instead of looking like the devil, we start to look like Christ. When men sin, he started to do things that are typical from the devil. He started to kill, started to hate, he started to, to lie, he started to be jealous and have envy, fights, wrath. Those are the characteristics of a person that is under uh, the devil. The man started to look like devil, the devil after sinning and being disconnected from God. But when we, receive Christ, when we receive Christ in our heart as our Lord and personal Savior, with time of passing of time, we are more like uh, uh, Christ. We look like more him. And it starts to be manifested what the Bible calls uh, the fruit of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. We start to love things that we didn't like before. We start to see persons that before maybe we did never were going to have any contact or relation. We start to realize that they also need of patience and of love and of attention and so many things. And we start to realize that now we have patience in things that before uh, we didn't and we were not able to stand them. And, and it's that every time that regeneration that transformation that is progressive in our life is molding us and we can look backwards and say I know that I still have a long way to go I still I know as the text say I have not reached the goal but I keep running to see if I reach to that that for what the Lord reached me once finally adoption now I have a family 
Now I am under a coverage that is the family of God. And we have known this evening two members of our family that they live in another place, but we could go around the world and realize that we have brothers and sisters in the faith practically in all the parts of the world because we have been adopted in a family that is universal where all fit and where all we have to learn to relation to relation and love and forgive and work together etc etc so a true conversion take us to justification regeneration and to form part of the family of god by adoption nor because of birth now the first text that i want to read to you this evening that speaks about conversion is in acts chapter 3 verse 19. peter and john just prayed for a paralytic that had been miraculously healed and now they take the opportunity to give testimony of their god to evangelize the persons that were there watching that miracle and he says in chapter 3 verse 19 Therefore, repent and return both words. You can repent of something that you have done, but that's not me that you have converted. You can repent of uh, stealing, of lying, or doing something bad, but that does not mean that you have changed. You have repented, but you have not converted or returned. But Peter says, therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be whipped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Epistrepho. That is strange word that is Greek is the word that is translated in the New Testament as a conversion or return. That means to turn around, to go back, to change direction to go in a direction contrary to the one that you were going. Logically, a true conversion is produced when there is a true and genuine repentance from our part. Not uh, that your conscience, uh, you're feeling bad, not a pain because you lost things that you had, but because of your bad head or your bad decisions you have lost. But there is a repentance that is genuine of not wanting to do again the same sin that for time uh, conquer me and uh, I was doing when there is a true repentance you can say that there is a true conversion and a genuine desire of changing and a genuine desire of honoring and serving the Lord that maybe before we didn't believe in him but now we have realized that we love him and we know him and in our way we want to take effort in serving him and honoring him all the days of our lives we don't have to confuse to come to church with a conversion because there is people that can come to church all their life. There is people that has been born let's uh, inside the church. Maybe from being the inside the mother, the mother brought them to church. And when they were born, they started to go to Sunday school and a sister camp, and they started to go to uh, uh, the activities. But that's not mean that they are converted. And how many times we are confused thinking or believing that this person, because I've been all their life in the church, is a converted person. And no, it can be a sympathizer sympathizer, a person that has their friends inside the church because their life has always been around the church, does not have contacts nor friends outside, and it seems that it's a believer, it seems that it's a converted person, but it's not. It's a person that has been raised in an atmosphere of Christianity, but it's not a Christian. Many times when I go sailing in those long trips that I do by boat, I... I sail in the boat, in the sea, but the sea does not go where I am. I'm surrounded by water, but I go inside the boat, and the boat, thanks the Lord, is over the sea. Imagine, uh, you can be surrounded by Christians in an atmosphere that is Christian, in a camp, in a convention that is Christian, but this does not mean that you also are a son or daughter of God, because the salvation is personal and you cannot transfer it, it's transferable. You cannot be converted for your son, nor your son for you. Of course, if you convert, you are a light for your family. You have a message and a testimony to give to your workmates in the place where you live, 
but you cannot convert for somebody else or for a family or for friends I, and say, I converted, and that means that all my family are going to be converted. No, I repeat, salvation, conversion is personal, and you cannot transfer it to another person. And also, we have to say that salvation is instantaneously, or either you are or not. You are inside of the kingdom or outside the kingdom. Either you are with me or against me. You are really converted and your name today at this moment in this instant is written in the book of life or your name does not appear anywhere. And if you die today, you, will not ever, you wouldn't go to the presence of the Lord. How was your conversion, brother or sister? Do you remember that day, that place, that hour? that place where the Lord touched your soul and touched your heart? Let's read some verses this evening where appears this word, epistrephos, that means to return, to convert. Let's see the different translations that have been given throughout the biblical text. For example, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verse 3, Matthew 18, 3, there are some words that are very interesting of the Lord Jesus Christ when he says to the multitude, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. The attitude to be able to be saved, the attitude to have a genuine and a true conversion is important. A person that is arrogant with proud, that believes, that knows everything, that does not need nothing or no one, very difficult, this person is going to get to a conviction of sin and will ask forgiveness to the Lord. Something that is very usual, and it happened to me this week on Thursday, while you were here uh, listening to the message of our brother Jeronimo that preached, I was outside speaking with a person, and we start to speak to this person. The first thing that he says to me, like, to uh, get a shield, let's say, be careful. I'm, and he said, I'm a Catholic. And I said, you are Catholic? And he says, yes. I said, truly? But do you practice? Do you confess regularly? Do you go to Mass? Do you accept the authority of the Pope over your life? Are you a good idolater? Do you do the, all the prayers? All those prayers that you know by memory? Are you a good Catholic? And he said, well, no. Then allow me to tell you you are nothing. And he said, it's true. I believe I'm nothing. Okay, now we are understanding each other. You know you know why you say you are Catholic? Because some persons of Spain many centuries ago went there and conquered you. And after leaving and coming back to their own land, after taking everything they could and more, you wouldn't have done it. He said, no, I wouldn't have done it. They left a religion there, dead and empty, that was of no use here, but they left it there. And this is why you say you are Catholic. But if, we, if the, cat, cat, the um, Spanish did not go, but the Muslims, then for sure, for sure, maybe probably you would be uh, being a Muslim. You didn't choose the religion, the religion chose you. And it was not something that you decided to follow nor accept that it was something that it was imposed to you nearly since uh, your birth. So when a person believed that because being Catholic or a member of a church be this one or the other, is saved, converted, is wrong. Because conversion does not go through a denomination. Conversion does not go through going being a member of a church. But conversion is an encounter. It's an experience, personal experience with Christ. I repent. I recognize that I'm a sinner. I recognize that I have been wrong. No, I always believe. I don't doubt that you believe. But let me remind you something. The most believer of the world, the one that never doubt of the existence of God, the one that believed that 66 of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is word of God, the one that believed in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one that believed in heaven, in hell, the one that believed in the parables, the prophecies, and the promises, the one that never have doubted of the existence of God is Satan, the devil. Because Satan is not an atheist. 
The Bible says that uh, to be an atheist, you have to be foolish. That's what the Bible says. And Satan is not foolish. Satan is, is the stamp of perfection and full of wisdom. That's the Bible, what he says, that uh, God created him. And Satan, you think he's going to be in the presence of the Lord with his church? But it's a, it's a believer. If he never doubted of the existence of God, is that believing is important? Yes, but it's not enough. There is not a merit in saying I believe in God. I have believed all my life. And you want me to touch, to play a special music because you believe in God? There is not a merit in believing in God. The merit is not simply in believing. The merit is in confessing that that God in which I believe from now on is going to be my Lord, my Savior, my coverage, my uh, owner, and my everything. I, I surrender to him my life, and then is when I start to experience the joy of salvation because you are not born being saved, and then with the passing of time, you condemn, but you are born condemned, and there is a moment in your life in which you convert and you experience the new birth, and it's of no use the theories. I'm a main man among the Jews that knew all the books of memory more than any of us said to the Lord, Lord, we know that you have come as a teacher because no one can do the signs that you do if God is not with them with him. And the Lord looks at him and says, look, Nicodemus, look, listen to me. If you are not born again, you cannot see nor enter in the kingdom of heaven, nor see nor enter, because my attention is to verbs, because it could have said, you could see the kingdom, you could see the glory, but you won't enter. Why did he say nor see nor enter? Because they reverence the one that they call Moshe Rabenu. Moses is our teacher, and they address to him with a respect. And they know perfectly that Moses did not enter in the promised land, but he saw the promised land. He saw it from the frontier of what we could say, uh, call today Jordania. Uh, the Lord said, you are not going to enter, I told you, but I'm going to allow you to see how beautiful it is, the promised land. And miraculously, he allowed to see Moses, all the land of Canaan, all the land where flows honey and milk, but he did not enter into it. But in your case, Nicodemus, all the Torah that you know by heart, all the 613 commandments that you know by memory since you're being a kid, all your superstition and all that you know in your memories, no, it's not going to be of any use, nor even to see the kingdom if you are not born again. You have to be born again to be able to see and enter and to be able to enjoy of that kingdom. And he just, because, but Nicodemus did not understand anything. And, but he said, this is impossible, Nicodemus said. But you are telling me for me to go again inside in the wound of my mother and be born again? I cannot do that. Nobody can do that. And the Lord explains to him that it's not that kind of birth, right? But it's the birth, the spiritual birth, that encounter with Christ. And what I, how I have said in several occasions, if you have been born once, you are going to die twice. But if you have been born twice, you are only going to die one. Some will say, I did not understand. Well, there I leave it for you to study. I repeat it again. If you have born once, you die twice. But if you are born twice, you will only die once. Next week, I will explain to you why. This is what the word says, that we have to be like child. There is a change in attitude. I'm not uh, hiding behind a religious teaching, whatever it is, however, regardless of the name, but I have to have the attitude of a kid, depending on our God and Father, knowing that it's not because of my own merits, not because of my good actions, not because of my good deeds that I get salvation of my soul, but because of the merits of him that we call our Lord Jesus Christ. How many say amen? There is another text in Luke 20, 22, verse 32, where it also appears this word, this Greek word that we mentioned it before, Luke 22, 32. Priscilla is going to read that text, please. 
But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. You have turned again. Turn again from where? From the way of apostasy that you have chosen. You disconnected from me, Peter. You de denied me and my name. You have said publicly, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know who is that man. You have to turn again back. You have to go to Epistrepho. You have to turn around, go backwards, and go to whom? To God, for him to forgive you again, for him to restore you again, and to put in first, be put in first line where you were, but you left because you deny me publicly. We all know, right? Once more, we see there, as this word is translated as a turning again. Do not go in that way, because you are in taking the bad way. There is a proverb that is very known that says, there are ways that two men, they seem right, but they end are ways of death. Death. If the sister that the other day sent me a WhatsApp saying that I can have problems in my hand because of I, how I get the microphone, do not be worried. I'm okay of my metacarpians and all of that. Acts 26. Thank you for being worried for me, sister, but every day I'm better. Say that we can, weak, I am strong, and he will renew our strength um, the Bible says they will be grow uh, strong and green. Amen. Some are green. Acts 26, verse 16. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jews, you wish people, and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me for them to be converted. If they are not converted, the only thing they have is a religion, but they do not have a conversion. They do not have a relationship with God. And I have changed you. I have freed you from your people and the gentle. I have transformed you. I have appeared to you in your way. I have taken the scale out of your eyes for you to be converted and become a witness of me and be and go all over the nations preaching the word for the people to go from darkness to light from the team of the devil, of the losers, of the ones with bitterness, to the kingdom of God. Amen? And for them to be converted, and being converted may know me, and may have the joy of salvation, and may inherit the everlasting life, because when a person is converted, it uh, becomes a inheritance with Christ, as the word of God says. There is one more verse, very interesting, that is addressed to those brethren that maybe one day they gathered, that maybe one day they were maybe even serving the Lord in a way, but because of uh, whatever reason, they departed from the ways of the Lord. And what do we do with these people? What do we do with those ones that seem that they wanted to end the world, let's say, and at the end, the world ate them? What word do, what solution does the Bible give it give to us for the one that took up wrong way? James says to us in chapter, James chapter 5, 19 and 20, says these very interesting words that we have to have into account in our life. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So exists the possibility that brother or sister take a way that is wrong. Exists the possibility that a brother or sister leave the correct way and go backwards and take the wrong way, like the prodigal son. And then the Bible says, if any among you has happened this to you, if any that was a brother of you and sang with us and gathered with us and served the Lord together with us, have gone in another way from the truth, know that if someone that turns a sinner from the error 
The sinner from the error of his way will save his soul and will cover multitude of sins. So there is a possibility of uh, be disconnected of the God that once lightened you, the God that once forgave you, of that God that one day transformed your life. But there is also the possibility of being able to turn back to him in repentance and the Lord will forgive you again and will restore you again because God saves but also restores to the persons that for whatever reason they have grown cold and gone in another way. We see in the Bible many callings to repentance, not only those callings that the prophets did to the people of Israel when they said, can't return, leave your works and go back to the old way, leave idolatry, leave corruption. Uh, but also we find in the New Testament a precious and very known parable of that young man that decided to live and spend all his uh, money and uh, live in a bad way and until he returns to him says, and he says, I will go back to my father and ask him forgiveness and say, Father, I have sinned against you in heaven. I'm not worthy of being called your son. And we see how the father restore him, gives a new garment, puts shoes in his feet, puts a um, ring in his hand, restores the authority, puts him again as the son of word dignity. And they do a feast because this son that I thought was dead has a return again to life. There is a tremendous examples in the Bible of persons that had a conversion that was tremendous with the Lord. For example, the Apostle Paul. The conversion of the Apostle Paul don't tell me that it was not a spectacular. A religious man that thought that had to be had to destroy to those that uh, those days were called the ones from the way that they were called for the first time in Antioquia, the Meshachim, the anointed wine, the Christians, and how he was as a witness in the death of Stephen, and he saw how they stoned him to death, and he was there and did not say, stop him, how are you going to kill him? But he was there and said, okay, do not worry, I will take care of your garments while you throw the stones. He was called as a stone, as an ice cube. He was there that day, and he took the uh, uh, prisoners, and he was going to go to Damascus, to take people to Jerusalem. Look at the long way he was going to make because he thought in his ignorance that that was his obligation. It was his duty to stop that that strange sect and uh, be expanded to all the nations of the earth. But it went the other way completely because going to Damascus, he falls to the land, he loses his sight, it, uh, and becomes blind, blind and a voice in Hebrew says, Saulo, Saulo, why do you go after me? Persecute me. Probably he was trembling from all, all his body saying, who are you? And when he listened to the reply, it was something tremendous. He said, I'm Jesus, the one that you are persecuting. What do you want me to do, Lord? Go into the city. And you will be told what you have to do. A few days, Ananias appeared that have nothing to do with the Ananias that died in the primitive church that was the husband of Sapphira and says that he was afraid of going to pray for Paul because he said, Lord, we have heard what this man has done. He has damaged your saints, the power that he has. And he has letters that authorize him to take us jail to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem to, into jail. And the Lord said, call him, go, because I have, he's going to be an instrument that I, I'm going to show him how much he has to suffer because of my name. And he put, lay his hands on him. Paul recovers his sight. He says, like, scales came out of the eyes, and there he's baptized. That ritual that the Jews did uh, uh, regularly to be purified, but now doing it from his heart, and says that at the moment, practically at the few days after, uh, he uh, became very brave preaching. In people said, wasn't this one the one that killed us, the one that was persecuting us? What happened to him? And the brethren were afraid of getting together with him. Yeah, how come they're not going to be scared? 
But nevertheless, a brother called Esteban said, Come, Paul, pal, I'm going to present to you the brothers. Brothers, do not be afraid. I present to you our brother, Saul of Tarsus, that from now on, the name is going to be changed. It's going to be called Michas or Paul. And he is a brother of us in the faith. And how he starts doing missionary trips. And at the end, Bernabe is under the coverage of Paul because knows that Paul is a man that God gave him a special grace to extend the gospel to another nation. And how after years, Peter, even speaking about Paul, says, Brethren, our brother Paul, to whom the Lord has given a huge wisdom and that right things are deep and difficult to understand, which the ones that do not know uh, turned around for their perdition. He recognized the anointing and wisdom uh, that uh, God put in the life of Paul, a genuine conversion. Paul never again was that person full of hatred, bitterness, resentment, but that uh, he suffered the stone be uh, beaten, tortured, and so many things, a conversion that was genuine. Amen? Do not tell me that the conversion is not the most, the uh, greatest miracle of all the ones that we can look at the throughout our lives. And what do you tell me of that Ethiopian, that colored man that was coming, sitting in his carriot after being in Jerusalem and half bought for sure uh, for a fortune, a pergamine of the prophet Isaiah, that I don't know how he could read it because it was in a different language, but it seems that he read it, but he didn't understand anything. Till Philip, that one that was a deacon in the primitive church, comes close to the chariot and says, do you understand what you are reading? And the Ethiopian, with all sincerity, says, I don't understand anything. As a lamb, I was taken to the to to die. Who was uh, taken? The one that wrote this is speaking another about another person. Then Philip goes into the chariot with the Ethiopian member of the uh, King Candas uh, servants and it starts to speak to him. And they reach to a moment to an oasis in the desert where they see water. And the Ethiopian says, "I want to be baptized. Is there an impediment?" Is there something that stops me to be baptized? My color of skin or, or that I'm not Jew? And Philip says, no, no, there is no impediment. Do you believe in Jesus with all your heart? And he says, I believe. Well, let's go and, be, and we can baptize you. A genuine conversion. Then the story says that he went to Ethiopia. She has, he has spoke to the Candace queen until the day today there is a great community of Christians in Ethiopia, and some say that he was the evangelist, the instrument that the Lord used to reach that nation. Amen? And what do you tell me about the jail man, the jail guard that lived in the city of Filippo? Didn't he have a tremendous conversion at midnight while there was an earthquake in the jail that the chains that the prisoners had were uh, fall down and the doors of the jail were open. And when that man was going to take his life in the midst of the darkness of, la of the night, after listening, singing Paul and Silas after they had been tortured, the he said, Lord, the Lord, what do we have to do to be saved? And Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And today you and your household will be saved. And he was able to transmit that conversion, that genuine change, leaving his idolatry and paganism and taking all his family that night in a jail. Look at what interesting service. The preaching, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and will be saved you and your household. Congregation, the jail of Philippo, preachers, Paul and Silas, resolved all a family was baptized at a spectacular service. And he was converted that night. A man that has received the calling of, of watch uh, in the most dark room of the jail. That same night, the jail guard converts and is baptized. You see how it's important conversion and not only believing in God. You see how without conversion there is no salvation. You realize how conversion has to be personal. And there is a moment in your life in which you have to make your own decision. Nor father, nor mother, nor the grandmother, grandfather. You have to say what you are going to do with Jesus. After listening to his word, after understanding the gospel. 
And if a characteristic, I believe that it's positive that this congregation has is that here it, we understand the word that we preach. You don't have to go in the midst of a preaching. These brethren that they live, I, I, that they get up, I imagine it's because they go to the service, but not because they have to go to the bookstore to buy a dictionary because they don't understand. It's not because of that. Because in this church, you can understand perfectly the message. It does not matter who preach it. Because the grace and the coverage of the Holy Spirit flows in all the ones that come up here to preach in a way that even the smallest one and the more new person can understand perfectly what that man wanted to say that day with the preaching of the gospel. And now that you have understood the gospel and that I have spoken to you about conversion, that I have spoken to you that you have to repent and convert, and it's not a matter of changing of image nor religion, it's a matter of changing of way. If in this evening among us is there any person that has never converted, now is the moment, the right moment, for you to have your own encounter and your ex personal experience with Christ Jesus. Close your eyes wherever you are and ask this evening, are you really converted? Are you really uh, giving your life to the Lord Jesus? Or simply you come to a church because you like it, because you have your friends here, because you know people here, you have friends here, or because really your heart is in Christ and in the church of the Lord. I want that in this evening all and each one of us make ourselves this question, am I really converted to Christ? Am I really a person that has put his or her life in the hands of the Lord? Or simply you are a person that come and you participate of the services but you have never had an encounter, a personal experience with the Lord Jesus Christ, today is the right moment. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. If you listen to his voice today, do not harden your hearts. Give your life, your heart to the Lord Jesus. And when you leave this place tonight, I want you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be with you 